most important thing that we can do to deter China from attacking Taiwan. <laughs> the, that is a very major issue. And it is, uh, uh, if you were going to have a discussion about that, I think that it's important for us to show support uh, for Taiwan. She did it. Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan this week, despite warnings from China of serious consequences, despite warnings from an influential commentator from her own side of the political aisle that her trip would be reckless, dangerous, and irresponsible. Even though Pelosi said that she went to Taiwan to show support for its defense and freedom, many people, Taiwanese or not, are wondering how Taiwan will actually benefit from her trip. Indeed, Taiwan is already suffering the consequences, with China having announced 100, on the last count, economic sanctions against Taiwan. Does the U.S. really care about the welfare of the Taiwanese people? Or does the U.S. simply see Taiwan as a pawn in its cold war with China? What would be America's next move? How would China react? What does this mean for the world economy and financial markets? Hi, I'm David Wu, a former Wall Street strategist with a 20-year track record of making actionable predictions about major global change. Welcome to The Money Game, where I take on groupthink, propaganda and conspiracy theories in my critical analysis of markets, economics, and politics. Before we begin, please hit subscribe and the bell button so that you will be notified when a new video comes out. People are products of their life experiences. I am no exception. I was born in the U.S. and spent most of my life in the U.S. But I grew up in Taiwan, where my family still lives. One of the most traumatic memories of my childhood is what happened on December 15, 1978. I was just 11 years old. What I remember more than anything else about that day was the atmosphere, the grim and worried faces of my parents and my grandparents. On that day, it felt like the world had ended for Taiwan. Because on that day, the United States, a country I've always understood was Taiwan's greatest friend, broke off official diplomatic relations with Taiwan. On that day, the United States recognized the government of the People's Republic of China, under the rule of the Chinese Communist Party, Taiwan's sworn enemy, as the sole legal government of China. On that day, the United States declared its intention to terminate the Mutual Defense Treaty, originally signed in 1954 between the U.S. and Taiwan that was designed to help Taiwan defend against a Chinese invasion. What I learned on that day is that when it comes to relationships between countries, there is a price for everything, including betrayal. The U.S. abandoned Taiwan 40 years ago because it saw China as a much bigger market for U.S. goods and U.S. companies. The irony, of course, is that 40 years later, with China close to overtaking the U.S. economically, technologically, even militarily, Washington now wants to be Taiwan's best friend again. The U.S. betrayal of Taiwan 40 years ago demonstrated to me that when there is a lot of money involved, profits are more important to Washington than democracy and human rights. I'm not saying that this is wrong as I believe that governments should act according to their national interest. But you can now understand why I was not impressed when Pelosi praised Taiwan this week for its democracy and human rights. Barry Goldwater and other mostly Republican lawmakers tried to block Jimmy Carter from terminating the defense treaty with Taiwan. They were unsuccessful, but they did manage to push through the Taiwan Relations Act in 1979. The Taiwan Relations Act does not commit the U.S. to Taiwan's defense in the event of war, but it does commit the U.S. to sell arms to Taiwan so they can at least defend itself. Even more importantly, the act says that the U.S. will consider any effort to undermine the future of Taiwan by other than peaceful means as a threat to the peace and security of the Western Pacific area and of great concern to the United States. Most experts today would agree that the ambiguity of these words about what the U.S. may or may not do in the event of a military conflict between Taiwan and China has helped keep peace between China and Taiwan for the past 40 years. Those words have kept Taiwan from pursuing a path of independence. Those words have dissuaded China from unifying Taiwan by force. As they say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yet, believe it or not, this is exactly what U.S. Congress intends to do right now at a great risk to the stability of the Pacific region and to the world. Senator Bob Menendez, the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and Senator Lindsey Graham have recently introduced a bill known as the Taiwan Policy Act of 2022 that they're touting as the most comprehensive restructuring of U.S. policy towards Taiwan since 1979. 
The bill seeks to increase military support for Taiwan, expand Taiwan's participation in international organizations, and lays out potential sanctions against China if Beijing engages in any significant escalation in hostile actions towards Taiwan. The cynic in me thinks that it's not a coincidence that Pelosi planned her trip to Taiwan in the same week that this bill comes up for a vote. Pelosi knows that China has to react to her trip to Taiwan. Pelosi also knows that if China reacts strongly, it will make it much easier to get enough votes to push the Taiwan Policy Act through Congress. I don't share Pelosi's politics, but I never underestimate her when it comes to knowing how to create the right conditions for getting a bill through Congress. Where does Biden stand on the Taiwan Policy Act? If the bill passes through Congress, he still has to sign it. I don't pretend to know the answer. But what I do know is that if Biden had been really against Pelosi's trip to Taiwan, he could have talked her out of it. According to Thomas Freeman in an article in the New York Times, he didn't even try. In politics, actions speak louder than words. If my hypothesis turns out to be correct, Pelosi's trip to Taiwan is just a prelude to the storm on the horizon. Because there is no doubt that the Taiwan Policy Act will lead to a serious escalation of tension between the US and China with Taiwan likely the greatest casualty. It is reasonable to assume that the Taiwan Policy Act will strengthen the hands of the hawks in both Washington and Beijing. The hawks in Washington will see it as hitting China where it hurts the most, while hawks in Beijing will see the act as paving the way for an eventual US recognition of Taiwanese independence. I suspect the act, if passed, will force Beijing to prepare for a naval blockade of Taiwan if not an outright invasion. Indeed, according to the Military Conflict Risk Index that I've developed in partnership with Riwi, a leading online survey technology company, over the past two weeks, there has been a massive surge in the number of people in both Taiwan and China who expect military tension between Taiwan and China to escalate in the coming weeks. What is worse, the likelihood that the U.S. will be forced to defend Taiwan means we could see direct confrontation between the two superpowers, however unthinkable this scenario may seem right now. Another sign that Washington is already preparing for a conflict with China is the passage last week by Congress of a $280 billion Chips and Science Act, a bill that will subsidize domestic semiconductor manufacturing. Taiwan is the world's largest manufacturer of high-tech semiconductors, with 90% of the global market share. Washington knows that a military conflict between China and Taiwan could create a shortage of chips. This will mean no new phones, no new TVs, no new cars. The Chips and Science Act has been sold as a major step forward for encouraging American innovation. But there's clearly another aim here. The act will reduce America's dependence on Taiwanese produced chips and give Washington a freer hand in pursuing a more confrontational policy with China. I fail to see what good can come out of this for Taiwan. In the worst scenario, it will become the battlefield of a war that would devastate its economy and people. In the best scenario, it will lose the crown jewel of its economy, the semiconductor industry, to the US. And for what? A recent survey shows that only 30% of Taiwanese people are in favor of independence, and just 5% in favor of it immediately. This isn't surprising. Taiwan already enjoys de facto independence. Taiwan needs to be clear-eyed about the real meaning of American friendship and not make the same mistake of entrusting its fate to Washington. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. By the way, according to the Riwi Unbound Military Conflict Risk Index, there has been a sharp increase over the past week in terms of the number of people in Taiwan who disapproved the approach of the Taiwanese government under President Tsai Ing-wen to the conflict with China. To me, this is pretty clear evidence that Pelosi's visit, organized by President Tsai, was not well received in Taiwan. All eyes will be on China in the coming weeks. How will Beijing react to the latest American provocation? Some people think the fact that Beijing didn't try to intercept Pelosi's plane en route to Taiwan is a sign of weakness. More likely, Beijing realizes that its reaction will have serious consequences and therefore wants to be fully prepared before it responds. If I were Xi Jinping, I would want to wait until there's more visibility around two key issues before taking action. First, will U.S. Congress push ahead with the proposed Taiwan Policy Act? Second, how will the Russia-Ukraine war play out in the coming weeks? China, like India, have continued to purchase Russian oil and gas. However, there are no signs that China is helping Russia evade the Western sanctions. 
nor is there any evidence that China is providing military aid to Russia. It is possible that until now, China has had no intention to risk taking its relationship with the U.S. to a breaking point. It is also possible that Beijing is not confident that Putin can win the war in Ukraine. But if U.S. Congress moves ahead with the Taiwan Policy Act, it will be evidence enough that the relationship with the U.S. is already at a breaking point. Furthermore, if Putin can finish the job in Donetsk and push back the so far unsuccessful Ukrainian counteroffensive around Kherson, it would put Putin in an unsaleable position in Ukraine. According to Thomas Freeman, who recently bragged about being invited by Biden for lunch at the White House, the Biden administration is a lot more concerned about Ukraine's leadership than they're letting on. That there is a deep mistrust between the White House and Zelensky that's considerably more than has been reported. In my view, the counteroffensive around Kyrgyzstan is Zelensky's last chance to demonstrate to Washington that he can still win the war. His troops have managed to blow up a few bridges across the Dnieper River with the goal of cutting Kyrgyzstan from its supply lines from the east of the river. But with Russian reinforcements moving southward and the lack of success of Ukrainian forces against the heavy artillery fire of the Russian army, the odds are heavily stacked against him. In my view, by September, it will become very clear to the world that the U.S. has lost the war in Ukraine. A weakened U.S. on the international stage will encourage China to go on the offensive, especially if Washington continues on its path of reckless provocation about Taiwan. The neocons who are driving American foreign policy right now will feel that they have no choice but to double down. Anthony Blinken recently called China the most serious long-term threat to world order. In previous videos, I called the Russia-Ukraine war a dress rehearsal for the new Cold War between the U.S. and China. I have no doubt that the risk that this Cold War can get hotter is the single greatest risk facing financial markets towards the end of this year and beyond. If you got something out of this program, I would appreciate if you were to hit subscribe and like. If you wish to learn more about my investment strategy, come visit us at davidwuunbound.com. Thank you for listening.